Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be giving this talk today because when I was told that your theme is space travel, I realized that in fact the story I could tell you would be able to weave the work that I've done over the course of my career with the history of space and space travel. Now, a lot of what you're going to be hearing will be ideas that are discussed in detail in a book that I wrote that's coming out in November called Augmented Reality. Now, this is not really a book about the technology of augmented reality, but it's the book that raises the questions that we need to be thinking about when we're either designing or using or deploying augmented reality systems at scale, which is something that we will be doing imminently in 2021, 2022, 2022 as companies like Facebook and Google and Apple move their products to market. But we need to start a little bit earlier than that. We're going to start with someone whom you might not have heard of. This is Ivan Sutherland. Now, I'm hoping at this point in your education, you may have learned who Ivan Sutherland is, but you might not have. Now, Ivan's still alive. He's in his mid-80s. He's in Oregon. He's still working in academia, I believe, at the University of Oregon. Ivan Sutherland has been working in the field for almost 60 years, but it's more than that. Ivan is the reason that there is a field at all. Let me explain why. As his PhD project at MIT in 1963, he wrote the very first piece of interactive computer software. It was a program called Sketchpad. It used a real-time computer, it used a light pen on a display, and it allowed you to use the light pen on the display to draw things onto the display so that there was a one-to-one -one correlation between the movements of the hand and what appeared on the display. Now, none of that seems at all interesting today. Today, that is simply the way computers work. Well, it's the way computers work because this is the way Ivan Sutherland invented the way that computers work. So every interaction that we have with any sort of human body part and a screen is fundamentally descended from the work that was done in Sketchpad. And so when you touch the surface of your smartphone and it responds, all you're doing is replicating the initial insight that Ivan Sutherland created with Sketchpad. And he won the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize in Computing for Sketchpad. Now, you'd think he might be able to rest on his laurels, but he didn't. He then went off and started to think of an idea that he was calling the ultimate display. Machines to sense and interpret motion data will be built. It will be seen, remain to be seen, if we can use a language of glances to control a computer. Perhaps we can make the display present itself everywhere we look, and then it would be the looking glass through which Alice walked. All right, so he calls this epication, this is 1965, he calls this the ultimate display. He has this idea that wherever you look, the display will simply follow you, so that basically the entire world becomes the display. Now, Ivan being Ivan, not only did he write about this in 1965, he then set out building it. And so in 1968, and this again is covered in the series that Oliver talked about 1968 when the world began, he presented something that he called a head-mounted display. Now the head-mounted display was actually the world's first augmented reality system. And here you can see there's just a little bit of video footage of Ivan actually in the system looking around. It's tracking his head through this armature that's coming up over the top, which gave the device the nickname the Sword of Damocles because it was hanging over you somewhat ominously. You can look around through it. And because it's using silvered mirrors, half-silvered mirrors with projections onto those mirrors, you can see out into the real world and into the synthetically generated world at the same time. Now, there's another thing that he did at exactly the same time because there was no real-time system for generating 3D images into this head-mounted display, so Sutherland also invented that. So real-time computer graphics, augmented reality, and interactive computing, and he did all of that in a five-year period of time. And the interesting thing to note here is that augmented reality is actually invented before 
virtual reality. But augmented reality is much more difficult than virtual reality because to do augmented reality well, you have to have a really strong awareness of the entire environment around. And sensors and computers in the 1960s simply weren't good enough to do that. So you could have a basic demonstration of what was possible with the head-mounted display, but you couldn't have a fully realized augmented reality system. And so, in fact, what happened is people went for the easy stuff first. And so, not quite 20 years later, it turns out that the first people to create a modern virtual reality system were NASA. So it turns out that the work in space and the work in virtual reality are fundamentally intertwined. This is NASA's virtual environment workstation. It was created in the mid-1980s, really starting 84, 85, 86. You can see the features here in, on the astronaut. The astronaut has a head-mounted display, looks a lot like the head-mounted displays that you see today. She's got an armature on her head, which is tracking the position of her head in real time. She's got gloves on that are tracking the position of her hands and also the relative extension of her fingers. So her hands are being tracked, her head is being tracked, there's a display in front of her eyes, there are speakers over her ears which are also producing 3D sound. This is the first instance of real 3D sound. So it's creating all of the effects that you need in the virtual environment. And again, because we aren't trying to incorporate the real world, it's much easier to create virtual reality. But that said, this system is connected to a million dollar supercomputer in 1985 terms, which means, of course, it's substantially less powerful than the smartphone that you have in your pocket right now. But this was a landmark because it put all of the elements together for the world's first practical virtual reality system. And here we are, 35 years later, virtual reality systems don't really look or work any differently. It's just that the components are faster and cheaper, but they're not fundamentally different. So this is how right both Ivan Sutherland and NASA got things 35 years ago. All right, why is NASA interested in virtual reality? Well, there's one very simple reason. It has to do with astronaut training. You see, when you train an astronaut, what you want them to do, if they're training for a mission in space, is you want them to rehearse that mission and rehearse that mission and rehearse that mission. Not so that they have an intellectual understanding of that mission, but so that it is embedded in their proprioception, so that they understand how their body is supposed to react at all points during the mission that they're on. Why? So that they don't have to think about it. When they're focusing on actually executing the mission, all of what their body is doing has been so thoroughly taught to them that it is embedded in their body. They simply don't have to think about it. The analogy you might want to think about is if you've learned how to drive a car. For the first year or so when you drive a car, you're very, very hypervigilant. You're really tuned into the vehicle. You're really trying to focus on getting it all right. And over that period of time, you develop a body sense for how the vehicle should be behaving, how you are working with the vehicle, and you kind of forget that you're driving. It's happening in a more, in a sense, in your body. This is what NASA was trying to do with astronauts. The only way they could do this is by building these huge flotation tanks, putting them astronauts in spacesuits, and getting them to carry those missions out in rehearsal in these tanks of water before the event. Okay, that works perfectly fine if you're on the ground. What happens if you're actually up in orbit and now there's a new mission? Maybe you need to repair the space shuttle. Maybe you need to go out and fix something that didn't need to. Or they've added a new mission. How do you rehearse for that? How do you then build that body memory? And this is why they constructed the VR system as something that could be used by astronauts in orbit to provide the training that they would need to rehearse a mission before they would go out and actually perform it. And although in 1985 this system was too bulky and the computer it required was too heavy, the computer was literally the size of a refrigerator, cost a million dollars, sucked down a lot of power, no way you're going to get that on a space shuttle. Now they actually have similar systems on the International Space Shuttle, uh, International Space Station, so that astronauts can rehearse missions in virtual reality before they actually go out and, and produce them because the systems are so much lighter, so much more flexible, so much more capable. So the system took time to evolve, but is now a basic part of mission training when you're in orbit, when you're an astronaut. Okay, so that shows you the history between space 
and virtual reality. Now, let's take a look at modern space travel. And we've all seen the Dragon capsule that got launched into orbit at the end of May. In fact, because it was happening when the planet was mostly in lockdown, all of us saw it because there wasn't a whole lot else going on. And one thing that was commented on that I took very careful note of was that the astronauts were surprised by the control surfaces in the Dragon capsule. Now, the control surfaces in the Dragon capsule, in a sense, have a lot in similar with, say, the control surfaces in a Tesla Model 3. The control surface in a Tesla Model 3 is effectively a large tablet, right? And you poke at it and you do the various things and it shows you your speed, it shows you your maps, all those things. It is a minimal but very flexible control surface. And that's exactly what the Dragon X capsule is providing to the crew. And you see the astronauts here are talking about, well, it's a different way of flying, da, 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 da. But it's also a very sort of Elon Musk, Tesla, design, SpaceX way of taking all the instrumentation that was visible before and virtualizing it. And so really what you have now is this transition. Now this is a Soyuz spacecraft. Soyuz are still used to lift astronauts into orbit. And in fact, until the Dragon launch, it was really the only way to get astronauts into orbit right now because they don't have the space shuttle anymore. Take a look at that. You can see how crowded it is. He's crowded in there with all the payload that they're bringing up. But take a look at the instrumentation panel and all of the buttons and knobs and all of the different things there. And he's holding a manual in his hand and it all looks really nasty and analog. And then compare it to the beautiful, cool, control surfaces in the Dragon. It's all very clean. It all looks very, very futuristic, very nice, very schmick. And I want to talk about that for a minute because that represents an instance of a larger trend in design. And I want to illustrate that trend by taking a look under the bonnet of a Mercedes E-Class 2020 model. So that is what it looks like under the bonnet. And what you see there is very little. That's the key point. What you see are basically the interfaces that you will need to put some coolant in the engine, to put some oil into the engine. Perhaps I think there's one other thing that the engine needs. Oh, perhaps it's the washer fluid for the windshield. All of those control surfaces are available when you open up the bonnet. Everything else is effectively completely hidden by a series of plastic grates. So the sophistication that is an engine in 2020, which has thousands of moving parts, which is a very carefully designed piece of machinery, which we've been working on for 130, 150 years to actually very carefully engineer, all of that complexity is completely hidden away. So you open up the bonnet, and there's nothing there. Now, why would you do this? Well, the way a car works in 2020 is that if something breaks on that car, if it's a Mercedes, you take it to the dealership. They will plug it into machines at the dealership, which will connect to the network that is already built into that car. That will run full diagnostics on all of the things that will tell the diagnostician exactly what needs to be repaired, and then the technician who has been specifically trained and has the specific hardware and software skills, because a car is now a very strong hardware-software hybrid, will in fact then make the repairs to the vehicle. And what this means is that effectively there are no user serviceable parts inside of this very complex machine because it's been hidden. In some sense, it's a form of security by obscurity. And hey, that's capitalism in 2020. But it also represents something else that was identified very strongly by the French postmodernists in the 1970s, which is this idea of a body without organs. If you Google that term, you'll find out that term has many different reads. In this case, what it means is you're taking a system that's built out of component parts, but encasing it in such a way that all of those component parts are completely invisible. So it just seems seamless. It just seems solid. And what that means is that you, even though you own this vehicle, even though you own this body, don't actually have power over it. Because power belongs to those who can pull back the covers and who can reveal it. And this is a big source of revenue for the car companies, which is exactly why they do it. So this phenomenon of making the physical control surfaces disappear and replacing them with highly networked, highly active software control surfaces, this is not just happening in spacecraft. This is happening across the entire industrial field. What happens when your car breaks and you're nowhere? 
Let's say you've decided you're going to take that drive today from Broken Hill to South Australia because you can for the first time in several months, and you're in the middle of the desert and your car conks out and you aren't in cell phone range and you don't know what's gone wrong with the car and you have no idea what's gone wrong with the car. And even if you can find someone to come and tow your car away, when it gets to that garage, are they going to have the tools that they need to be able to analyze what's gone wrong with your vehicle so that they can fix it for you? So what you've done by hiding all of the complexity is to decrease resilience and increase fragility in the system because when these systems break, if the mechanisms for repair are not immediately obvious, it becomes next to impossible to repair them. So that's the next generation cockpit for the Dragon that's going to be carrying, I think, seven people up into orbit for space tourism and all sorts of other things. And you can notice the stunning lack of control surfaces. It's got basically something that you look up at. It's got a sort of flight control panel that you can look at and that you can probably tap at. And that's going to be fine as long as everything is working perfectly. What happens if there's a failure, and I don't mean just a little failure, but what happens if there's a catastrophic failure that causes the power system to fail, or the network system to fail, or some combination of those, so that the displays are not powered, so that the network which connects to all the devices are not working? How can you even begin to analyze or diagnose or solve that problem? And this is one of the things that is one of the design tensions when you simplify things, when you hide them behind these combined hybrid interfaces and don't present those interfaces through meaningful affordances, you're going to remove the, the idea that someone can actually repair something in a situation where repair isn't just important, but in this case is probably vital. And if they don't get the ca space capsule repaired, they're going to die. So how do you balance that need for simplicity, which is also cheaper, which is another reason why they do it, versus the need for affordance and repairability? And this is a fundamental tension in design. Now, this is where augmented reality can come in and start to resolve some of those tensions. So this is the new Microsoft HoloLens. It was a made available last year to commercial customers of Microsoft. I think it's now finally available to the broader public to be able to buy. And of course, a modern augmented reality system uses a very sophisticated series of cameras. Basically, the head-mounted display is completely studded with cameras, which are doing a mapping of the space that the person is in in real time, so that as they move around the space, the cameras are tracking the movement of the body in space, the gaze direction of the body in space, and then mapping that onto a display so that objects that are placed into the display field maintain their absolute position as the user looks around. So you can look away and come back again and that object will remain in space. And this now provides what I like to call digital depth, the ability to look on something that is offering no obvious affordance and to see into its digital nature, see into its inner nature, reveal all of the information that has gone into creating this device, that goes into maintaining this device, that goes into testing the device's operation, and making that then as transparent as possible to someone who is looking on it so that they have the information that they need in that moment to be able to do the operation that they need to do. We are only just at the beginning of that because we've only just started to get a class of devices that would enable that kind of facility. But you can see that this is exactly the kind of thing that they're going to need in a SpaceX space capsule. This is exactly the kind of thing that they should be handing the Mercedes owners. Your engine doesn't work here. Slap this on. You'll be able to have a look in. You'll be able to understand what's wrong. And maybe you'll take it to the dealership. But at least you'll know what to tell someone if they're trying to repair the vehicle. So this now represents a new way of interacting with a world that has been increasingly hidden behind digital lines. We have spent the last 30 years of the web revolution 
applying an enormous amount of data to the world, which is mostly invisible to us. So we're surrounded in a sea of data. Some of it's locative data, some of it's not locative. But locative data, and there's a lot of that as well, is completely invisible to us because we have no way of making it visible. Augmented reality takes that locative data, whether it's an engine block, whether it's a vehicle as a whole, whether it's a spacecraft, whether it's a home, whether it's an office building, it doesn't really matter. All of these things have huge amounts of data s contained within them that is effectively invisible to us. So what it means is that in the world of 2020, we are stumbling around blind inside of an extremely information-rich environment. That inf information is important above and beyond its ability to help us to navigate through it. Now, what you're going to see, as I said at the beginning, is you're going to see a whole new class of devices. Facebook and Apple are probably going to be the first to market. Last week, Facebook announced Project, Project Aria. Project Aria is not actually a set of AR spectacles, although it looks like this. Facebook Project Aria is a set of sensors because essentially what Facebook Project Aria is doing is doing everything it can to suck up as much information about the environment as possible to produce as accurate a map as possible. When they get good enough in the display component, then they'll start to put data in. But right now, it's really just a data device. They call the users of this device ego sensors. In other words, you're sensing from the position of the self out into the world. You have to do that well in order to do augmented reality. And This has historically been the big stumbling block to getting high quality augmented reality systems because to do this kind of thing is incredibly computationally intensive. But we're now starting to see a class of devices, and this is the beginning of a class of devices, that will be consumer friendly. We know that Apple will be releasing its own devices probably either next year or the year after. Facebook looks to be releasing the first of its devices in 2021 or 2022. So now it's no longer a weird idea to think that that Mercedes-Benz owner would need to be carrying some device with them in order to get a look into their engine. In fact, they're already going to be wearing that device. And then when they look down into the engine, it needs to be able to attack and attach the systems from Mercedes so that when it looks down into that engine, the data that the owner needs to see in order to understand what's going on in that engine is made plainly clear to them. What this means is that as these devices come out, as these devices come into common use, there is now going to be a first order design task that will consume your lives as designers for at least the new two, two, next two decades, which is that you are going to be inscribing the world. You are going to be organizing and presenting this digital depth of data, bringing it forward from its invisibility into apprehensibility so that it can be used by people when they need it, when they need that depth of understanding. But what does that mean in practice? Well, so I'm going to show you the video. I'm going to talk in front of the video. This video was shot on the 23rd of July in 2016. Now, this video was shot in Rhodes, which is a suburb of Sydney, about 20 k's out of the center. There's a train station out in Rhodes. You might have been through it. And it's shot above a little public park called Peg Patterson Park. Now, there's a lot of people here. This is a weeknight. This is a Tuesday night. It is 11 p.m. Why are there so many people in this park at 11 p.m. on a Tuesday night? Well, they're all playing Pokemon Go. You may or may not know this, but Pokemon Go was released in Australia a few days before it was released everywhere else in the world. And Pokemon Go was a joint project with Nintendo, who owns the Pokemon brand, and Niantic, which is a spin-out of Google to make locative media and locative media games using augmented reality. And if you've played Pokemon Go, you know, you look, you hold the smartphone up, you can see the world around, you can see the Pokemon in them, and it situates the Pokemon within the real world landscape. And because Niantic had already known about this park and had used it in a previous game called Ingress, they had cited some particular Pokemon in this park. And so when the game was released, a few people actually found this park 
and they caught some of the Pokemon there, and then they messaged some friends, and those friends came by, and then, because there's a feature in the game that allows players to lure Pokemon to a spot, one of the players did that, and actually everyone gets to see Pokemon who are lured in by Pokemon, and so people started messaging one another, wow, there are all these rare Pokemon in the park, and it snowballed over social media very quickly, so that night after night after night, there were these incredible crowds of young people. They were completely fine. They weren't even particularly noisy. They were just there playing the game, but they were doing this on a weeknight with all of these suburban high-rises around them making a lot of noise, because it's a lot of people, and completely disturbing the neighborhood until the police had to break it up. It wasn't quite a riot, but it was close enough, and it was this gathering of people. And you can hear this videos from YouTube. You can hear this is one of the people who's living above the park. She's just sitting there complaining that it's 11 o'clock, her kids are trying to sleep, no one can do anything. So what Nintendo did, innocently enough, was to take the park and inscribe the space in the park with some data. But what they didn't think about was the consequence of that inscription. When you write in space, you offer people the opportunity to think about that space differently. And if you remember nothing from this lecture, remember this one point. When you change space, you change people's behavior in space. So when you write something into a Mercedes engine that becomes visible to people, or onto a spacecraft that is visible to people when they're trying to fix it, they will follow the guidelines that you're establishing, which means your role as a designer is now going to be a role that shapes behavior in space in a fundamental way, because we will be apprehending space differently, very differently than we ever have before. So you need to think carefully about your design decisions here. You need to think consequentially, because the decisions you make may not have consequences that are immediately visible, but could still be profound. Thank you.